Welcome to this benefit event for students, scholars, and publicly engaged academics in Ukraine. The title of the conference is What Good is Philosophy? The Role of the Academy in a Time of Crisis. My name is Peter Lowen, and I'm the director of the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at the University of Toronto. And it's my pleasure to say a few words about this conference and about Kyiv Mohila Academy. It's a great pleasure to open this benefit event. It represents the joint commitment of the Monk School of the University of Toronto and of colleagues from across the globe who have joined us, and especially brave colleagues at KMA and across Ukraine. It represents our joint belief, I think, that universities have something to offer and that philosophy has something to offer, maybe especially during these times of crisis. We'll hear a lot today about Ukraine, and I know these talks will bring some clarity to that situation. Of course, we don't need any clarity on the Russian, on the morality of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. There is none. Nor do we need any clarity on the morality of Ukrainians or of their courage, including our academic colleagues who continue their mission. But we do need clarity on how we can right the wrongs that have been done, on what we owe one another in the future, and on how we can make the world a safer place once again. So thank you to all of you for being here and being part of this commitment. Let me just say a few words about Kiev Mohila Academy. I stand in awe of our colleagues at KMA and their commitment to keep their university open, both physically and intellectually. I know that sometimes when we take Zoom calls with you, you're taking them from the shower, from the closet, because that's the safest place to be during an attack. I know that you sometimes have to move your classes into a basement and into shelters. It would be so much nicer to have them in classrooms or even outside. Every one of these actions speaks to your real commitment to the academy, and we watch it in awe. And I'm so happy to say that the University of Toronto has been able to play a small part in partnering with KMA by welcoming now hundreds of students from KMA for visits to the University of Toronto, after which they can return to their university. And we look forward to welcoming hundreds more and I hope this represents the start of a relationship that goes on for decades and for decades. It's my pleasure now to introduce the organizer and host of this benefit event for the Ukrainian Academy, Aaron Wendland. Aaron is a Vision Fellow in Public Philosophy at King's College London and a Senior Research Fellow at Massey College in Toronto. Aaron, thanks so much and over to you. Thanks for the introduction, Peter. As Peter said, my name is Aaron Wenlin. I'm Vision Fellow in Public Philosophy at King's College London and a Senior Research Fellow at Massey College Toronto. And it's an honor to be hosting this benefit event for the Ukrainian Academy. I appreciate that no one is here to see me talk, but as host, it is my responsibility to explain a bit of the background, explain some of the aims, and explain the philosophical import of this rather unusual philosophy conference. I should begin by saying that Ukrainians have been fighting Russian troops, or at least Russian-backed troops, in their country since Russia invaded Crimea in 2014. But the backstory for this benefit event begins with Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine in February 2022. Um, I was in Toronto at the time, and I'm sure like many of you, I was horrified watching Russian troops advance on Kyiv. Uh, at the same time, I felt a little bit uncomfortable, uh, in part because the people in my vicinity didn't seem to appreciate what it meant for a major nuclear power to be invading a neighbor with 100,000 troops. There was a certain complacency in Canada that made me feel uncomfortable. Uh, so a couple months later, when a friend of mine from the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation explained that they were going to have some gaps in their Ukraine coverage and that they could use a freelance journalist on the ground, uh, I decided to jump at this opportunity, in part because I thought it was the best way I could use my public philosophy skills, or at least the most sort of important use I could find for those skills at that particular moment. Um, 
So a few weeks later, I found myself in Kyiv. Uh, I did some background research for the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. I wrote some stories for the Toronto Star. And then I was commissioned to write a story about the state of higher education in Ukraine. Uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, colleges and universities in Ukraine were in a bit of disarray. Uh, and maybe some numbers help here. Uh, by June 2022, uh, some 7,000 Ukrainian academics had left the country. Uh, as of today, uh, 170 Ukrainian institutions of higher education have uh, been damaged uh, by the fighting and the war. Uh, some 20 have been completely destroyed. And uh, I have to say that Ukrainian students, scholars, and publicly engaged academics continue to do their work in Ukraine under very difficult circumstances. Now, when reporting and doing research for this story, uh, two things really sort of stood out to me. I guess there are two sort of takeaways. Uh, when I was speaking to senior administrators at Ukrainian universities, they all sort of without fail explained to me that they see Western universities and Western institutions providing a fair bit of support for Ukrainian academics and Ukrainian students who left the country. But there was very little international support uh, coming into Ukraine to support Ukrainian scholars working in Ukraine. Um, and in some ways, uh, I, I appreciate the, the support that, that, that Western countries are, are providing for Ukrainian academics who have left the country. It's important to provide support for these people who've made the difficult decision to leave home. But it also really hit home to me to see these Ukrainian academics working in a war zone with, with, with very little international support. Um, I guess the second takeaway was that Ukrainian students, scholars, publicly engaged academics were doing amazing work in very difficult circumstances. So, uh, for example, at Kyiv Mohila Academy, uh, the oldest university in Ukraine, students were volunteering their time to visit elderly people whose families had left the country or whose children were fighting on the front lines. Uh, postdocs were running public lectures on Ukrainian history to counter Russian propaganda. Psychology professors were volunteering their time and expertise to counsel their fellow citizens who had spent time under Russian occupation in Irpin and Bucha. And Ukrainian philosophers and political scientists were sort of volunteering their expertise to the international media. They were commenting on Ukrainian history and politics and culture. And they were doing a service not only to foreign correspondents, but to the international community as a whole. And this work was very inspiring. Uh, and so I found myself thinking, well, I could write a story about the state of higher education in Ukraine, or perhaps there is something I could do myself to help support the work that Ukrainian academics in Ukraine are doing with very limited resources. Uh, hence this benefit event for the Ukrainian Academy. Um, I guess at this point I should say a little bit about what this benefit event will actually support in Ukraine. So the aim of the conference is to generate the seed funding for a Center for Civic Engagement at Kyiv Mohila Academy. And this Center for Civic Engagement will develop in three stages, a foundational stage, a expansion stage, and then a reconstruction stage. So I'll say a bit about each one of these stages. Um, so the first stage is designed to provide support for work that Ukrainian academics are already doing in Ukraine. Um, so some of the podcasting work, some of the journalism, some of the civic engagement, some of the public outreach that I already mentioned. We're going to try and get some resources to Ukrainians who are doing this excellent work. Uh, at the same time, we want to try and mitigate the brain drain that Ukraine has experienced since Russia's full scale invasion. So we want to give international scholars an opportunity to give lectures in Ukraine to write 
uh, in Ukrainian newspapers and just generally contribute to the intellectual life in Ukraine during the course of this war. Um, so this is the first stage of development for the Center for Civic Engagement. The second stage um, is going to work to keeping Ukrainian academics in Ukraine. So uh, a number of universities, particularly in the east and in the south of the country, have been destroyed. A lot of academics from that part of the country have left uh, Ukraine completely, but some of them are still in Ukraine and they would appreciate the opportunity to continue their research and work within Ukraine. So we're going to try and create a domestic scholars at risk program within Kyiv um, so that scholars who've been bombed out of places like Mykolaiv have a place to work within Ukraine. Um, we're also going to launch a sort of repatriation fellowship so Ukrainian academics who've left can come back. And the rationale behind this is that the best way to provide students in Ukraine with higher education is to keep Ukrainian academics in Ukraine or to bring Ukrainian academics back to Ukraine. So at the second stage, we're going to launch this fellowship program to support sort of academic research and teaching in Ukraine. Um, the third stage is the reconstruction stage. And um, Ukraine was recently granted EU candidacy status, and this means that they're going to be eligible for a significant amount of EU funding in the post-war period. Uh, this funding is designed to help get Ukrainian institutions up to EU standards. And the idea is that having already worked on the Center for Civic Engagement, we'd have sort of the basic institutional structures in place to work with our partners in the EU to ensure that world-class education is available in Ukraine in the post-war period. Um, so this is the reconstruction stage. Um, of course, this entire project is, funding this entire project is beyond the, the sort of means or scope of this, this benefit event. But, um, your contribution will go to support the foundational stage uh, of a Center for Civic Engagement at Kyiv Mohila Academy. So we'll be supporting the work Ukrainians are doing in Ukraine today, and it will be supporting the work we're going to try and do to help prevent the brain drain in Ukraine. Um, that said, I am a professional philosopher, uh, and I think at this point it's probably worth spending some time explaining the, the philosophical import of the sort of humanitarian work that I'm doing. Uh, and I think the best way to sort of explain the, the relationship between sort of my philosophical background and this humanitarian work is just to talk about my sort of philosophical influences and how they impact how I see the world and how I act in the world. Um, so my background is in the history of philosophy and in continental philosophy. And one of the most influential thinkers uh, on my work is a Jewish philosopher named Emmanuel Levinas. Uh, he's a Holocaust survivor, and he is famous for the idea that ethics is infinitely demanding. Uh, and to explain what he means by this, I think all we have to do is sort of look around in the world. Um, there's a war in Ukraine. Um, there was recently heavy fighting in Ethiopia. Afghan women are uh, seriously oppressed. Um, there was a major earthquake in Turkey. Uh, perhaps closer to home, there's a homelessness crisis in many North American cities. And I'm sure everyone knows someone who is ill or could use some form of help. Um, so there is an infinite amount of things we could potentially do to help others. And this is kind of what Levinas means by saying that ethics is infinitely demanding. There's an infinite demand on our capacity for ethical action. Um, but what Levinas notes is that although there might be an infinite demand on our capacity to act ethically, we are finite and limited human beings. He takes this notion from Kierkegaard, who has a lot to say about human finitude. But the basic idea is, although there might be infinite demands on my ability to act ethically, um, 
my abilities are actually limited. I'm a finite human being. There's only so much I can do. And at this point, Levinas kind of draws on the work of a German philosopher named Martin Heidegger, who talks about our thrownness into a particular situation. So as human beings, we always find ourselves in a particular place at a particular point in time. And this is the space for our ethical action. Um, we work within this sort of limited sphere that we've been thrown into. Um, so in my case, I happened to be in Toronto when Russia launched its full-scale invasion of Ukraine. I was given the opportunity to do some reporting on Ukraine, and this seemed like the most valuable or best use of my time at this particular moment in my life or history. Um, and so I went and did this. Then when I was in Ukraine, I was given the opportunity to report on higher education, and I thought I could write a story about this, but I thought the best thing I could do with my time and given my background was to try and get some support to academics working in Ukraine. So again, this benefit event. Um, for the analytic philosophers out there, I think there's an analog in the work of Jonathan Dancy and moral particularism. So the basic idea here is that um, I don't have a God's eye view of the universe. Uh, I don't know what's good for the universe as a whole, um, given my limited understanding and my finitude, but I do find myself in a particular situation and the particular situation I find myself in places some demands on my capacity for action. It gives me opportunities to act ethically. And in some ways it almost solicits ethical action from me. When I find myself in a particular situation, I'm almost pulled to do certain things. Um, so speaking, I guess, of concrete situations, I want to talk a little bit about the sort of situation on the ground in Ukraine today as a way to sort of talk about the philosophical import of this project in slightly less personal terms. Um, so when I was in Ukraine, uh, I saw all kinds of people doing excellent work, not just academics. Um, people from all walks of life seemed to be helping their fellow citizens and doing what they could to keep their country running. And what I realized was that keeping civil society functioning was incredibly important for sort of the war effort. Of course, trains need to be running and food needs to be coming in um, and getting to the front lines and this kind of stuff. Um, but also keeping life going in Ukraine and keeping sort of vibrant intellectual debate and uh, sort of active civil society was important for the morale of the country and the morale of, of Ukrainians. Um, but I guess what was really clear to me when talking to everybody was that they saw their fight as in some ways, I guess, our fight. So Ukrainians saw themselves as fighting for things that we value, freedom, democracy. Uh, these are things that, that they value and that they are fighting for. And this in some ways means that Ukraine's fight is our fight insofar as we're committed to freedom and democracy. Now, of course, I'm not in a position to uh, pick up a gun and fight on the front line. I'm a professional academic, not a soldier, but um, I share the values that the Ukrainians are fighting for, and I'm trying to do what I can do to help Ukrainians by organizing this benefit event for the Ukrainian Academy. Um, this is my way, I guess, to stand up for, for freedom and democracy. Um, and I suppose this, this desire is really just inspired by the excellent work that Ukrainian sort of scholars, students, and publicly engaged academics are doing in Ukraine. Um, and I encourage you to contribute to this initiative uh, in some way. Uh, I imagine many of you share my values and also share the values of Ukrainians. So I, I, I encourage you to, to support this initiative as as generously as you can. Um, okay, I, I, I understand that, that people here are not um, 
well, attending this conference to see me speak. So I just want to say we have a fabulous roster of, of speakers over the next few days who've generously offered their time to participate in this benefit event for the Ukrainian Academy. Um, so we'll put some information up on the screen that will enable you to contribute to this initiative. And I just want to say thank you in advance for all your support. I really appreciate it. And I'm sure my colleagues in Ukraine do too. So thank you very much.
Thanks everyone for attending this benefit event for the Ukrainian Academy. The title of the conference is What Good is Philosophy? The Role of the Academy in a Time of Crisis. And it's meant to generate support for establishing a center for civic engagement at Kiev Mohila Academy. This center will provide support for students, scholars, and publicly engaged academics in Ukraine who are doing fantastic work in very difficult circumstances. We'll provide some information on the screen after the talk uh, so you know what you need to do to contribute to this cause. With that said, it's my pleasure to introduce Jennifer Nagel. Jennifer is Professor of Philosophy at the University of Toronto. She is the author of Knowledge, A Very Short Introduction, and her recent work focuses on intuitive impressions of knowledge and belief and on what these impressions tell us about knowledge itself. The title of Jennifer's talk today is Philosophy for Better, for Worse, and in Itself. Jennifer, it's a pleasure to have you here. I really appreciate you participating in this benefit event for the Ukrainian Academy, and the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Aaron. Um, lately, I've been feeling very much indebted uh, to Ukrainians, and not only for the obvious reason that they are fighting for human freedom. Thank you so much for that. Um, I've been feeling indebted to Ukrainians because they've managed somehow through horrific bombardments and blackouts, they've managed to sustain an outrageously inspirational civil society. Here in North America, we see glimpses of radical new Ukrainian art. We see flickering videos of underground concerts that are truly moving. Uh, we've been hearing uh, Vladimir Yermolenko's excellent podcast, uh, Ukraine World, a podcast which explores everything from political parallels between Syria and Ukraine to philosophical themes in the writings of the 19th century poet and dramatist uh, Lesia Ukrenka. So let me just thank Ukrainians um, for reminding us of what really has value in human life. Here in Canada, where the power only fails briefly after ice storms, and we have the luxury of peace, it's easy to lose sight of the power of philosophy. We sometimes see efforts to remind each other of this power. And I have to say the image that comes to mind for me at this point is a poster um, that's tacked up in the hallway of my philosophy department. Um, it's entitled, Who Studies Philosophy? Uh, and it's produced by the American Philosophical Association. It's available for download on the uh, resources section of their website. Um, and at least in our department, this poster is, is tacked up between, you know, some kind of flyer begging students to give feedback on their end of term course evaluations and another poster which kind of warns you about five things that constitute cheating on exams and assignments. So this what is philosophy poster is this very, very small patch of inspiration on what's otherwise a pretty bleak board. The poster is simple in its design. It's just got this question, who studies philosophy? And it's got a bunch of names and pictures. Um, and it's not necessarily who you might think. Like there's a prominent picture of the much loved uh, game show host, uh, Alex Trebek, uh, recently dead. And, uh, and the singer songwriter, Lana Del Rey, uh, very much alive. For some of those who are listed, the connection with philosophy is really clear. Um, so we see Beverly McLaughlin, who's the first woman and longest serving chief justice of the Canadian Supreme Court. Uh, and she's very openly credited her education in philosophy as a guiding force in her judicial thinking. So I, I'd like to think that the University of Alberta's philosophy department where she took her BA and MA in our discipline gets a bit of credit uh, for making Canada one of the first uh, countries in the world to legalize same-sex marriage, and for many of the other um, great decisions that the McLaughlin Court made during um, Beverly McLaughlin's time as Chief Justice. Um, for other names on this Who Studies Philosophy poster, the connection's a bit more mysterious. There's, you know, the 
um, actor and martial artist Bruce Lee up there. And I'm not sure exactly what his relationship is to philosophy, but you know, I get it. He looks really cool on the poster. Um, to the APA's credit, they have included some people who don't look good at all, um, like the businessman and cryptocurrency enthusiast Patrick Byrne, who used to run a company called Overstock, um, although he, he ended up quitting in disgrace for reasons that have, it's a long story, but some connection to Vladimir Putin. Um, Patrick Byrne, who has a PhD in philosophy from Stanford, uh, has recently been on tour denying the legitimacy of the most recent American election and claiming that vaccines are poisons. Um, I feel that it adds tremendously to the credibility of the poster um, to see him there. You know, it's like philosophy can take you anywhere. This is not a poster that just tells you what you want to hear. There's a nice kind of even handedness in it. It gives equal prominence to Ayn Rand, uh, the libertarian author, and to Stas Turkel, um, the radical labor sociologist, equal prominence to Angela Davis and to George Will, to Bill Clinton, to Rudy Giuliani. There's a famous rabbi, there's a pope, uh, and there's a couple of very outspoken atheists. I mean, doubtless this is not a representative sample of people who have studied philosophy. But I don't think there's any other academic discipline that could pull together such a constellation of figures like history, English lit, I want to see what you've got. But I'm not sure you rival this cast of characters. I mean, of course, the fact that these characters have studied philosophy doesn't entail that our discipline made them into what they are. I mean, that's the first thing we learn in philosophy, right? That correlation is not the same as causation. Maybe there's some kind of common cause explanation. Drawing a certain kind of person both to study philosophy and to make some huge splash in the world. Still, there's a case to be made that there's more than just that kind of correlation here, because as a discipline, the academic study of philosophy fosters freedom of thought. There's no specific doctrine you need to hold. There's nothing you need to take for granted to be doing philosophy the way that you really do need to take the existence of volcanoes for granted to be doing volcanology. You can go ahead and deny the existence of the external world. You can swear off classical two-value logic, even worse in my eyes, and you'll still be doing philosophy as long as you show some dedication to working out the consequences of your radical choice. There's something peculiarly philosophical about the spirit of being willing to challenge anything or rethink what's, already, what's always been taken for granted. When it's coupled with training in the production of arguments, this spirit of intellectual freedom is what turns philosophy into a discipline that enhances your ability to do anything at all, whether that's leading a major world religion or trying to persuade people that God does not exist. Here we might wonder about the neutrality of philosophy. Philosophical training is sometimes marketed to undergraduates as a generic skill set that can be used for any purpose whatsoever. Um, you just learn to construct an argument to support any given conclusion, no matter how outrageous, which in North America is a pathway into the lucrative professions of law and consultancy. Actually, I'm, I myself took a detour into the lucrative world of, uh, of corporate public relations for a couple of years after my undergraduate degree and no doubt was strengthened in it by my philosophical training. If this is what philosophy really does, it just enhances completely neutral skill set, then our departments should be more than a little worried about what's brewing in artificial intelligence right now. Because I think if you know how to prompt them, these new chatbots are getting very good at writing arguments for anything at all. And they're just completely shameless in their capacity to follow instructions without regard for the truth. Their syntax is terrific and they're really fast. Philosophers themselves might observe that it's somewhat contrary to our discipline's self-image to focus so directly on how our graduates will turn out or what they will do in life. Indeed, the highest status forms of philosophy have no direct connection to practical use. And there's a certain kind of philosopher who takes pride in this. I'm reminded of something the Estonian philosopher and politician Margit Sutrop uh, once said to me. Uh, in her words, there's a certain kind of analytic philosophy that is just endlessly sharpening the knife that never cuts. 
Now, as far as the threat of chatbots is, is concerned, sorry, I'll say that again. As far as the threat of chatbots is concerned, philosophers can take some comfort in the thought that philosophy itself doesn't consist of following prompts or orders from users or clients. Although the training we provide can be used to those ends, philosophy itself can be applied to the deeper question of what ends should be pursued in the first place. And as for the concern that true philosophical thinking is practically useless, the course of human history has shown that philosophical thinking, especially in times of crisis, has made a deep difference to political reality. When it's time to abolish slavery, or compose a charter of rights and freedoms, a well-sharpened knife can be put to very good use. Of course, we're not guaranteed in advance that philosophy will always cut in the right direction. And here my thoughts turn back to that poster. One of the characters I recognize with a shiver is the billionaire Peter Thiel, who's co-founder of PayPal and an early investor in Facebook. Uh, and he's also someone who studied philosophy at Stanford. In a famous 2009 essay, he complains about government restrictions on human freedom. He's a libertarian. Uh, and he declares, there are no truly free places left in our world. Uh, he goes on to say that, and I'm quoting, I no longer believe that freedom and democracy are compatible. Um, and in his view, it's democracy that's got to give. He, he wants to blame women um, who are a notoriously uh, tough constituency, he says, for libertarians, for this incompatibility between freedom and democracy. His vision for the future involves non-democratic, privately owned islands in international waters. Um, I think it's a terrible vision, and his philosophical arguments against democracy aren't very good, but they should make us think twice about the idea that support for philosophy is automatically in line with democratic ideals. If the defining feature of philosophy is its disciplinary power to challenge anything, we should be sensitive to its power to make things worse. This is not a new fear. It's expressed quite vividly by Rousseau in his Discourse on the Origin of Inequality. So Rousseau sees humans as naturally compassionate and philosophers in unequal societies as having an exceptional rational capacity to stifle that aspect of their humanity. Compassion is lively in the state of nature, even among animals, Rousseau suggests. In his view, and I'm quoting, it is reason which turns man's mind back upon itself and divides him from everything that could disturb or afflict him. It is philosophy that isolates him and bids him say at the sight of the misfortunes of others, Perish if you will, I am secure. Nothing but ge such general evils as threaten the whole community can disturb the tranquil sleep of the philosopher or tear him from his bed. A murder may with impunity be committed under his window. The philosopher has only to put his hands to his ears and argue a little with himself to prevent nature, which is shocked within him from identifying itself with the unfortunate sufferer. I think Rousseau is not wrong about the potential power of philosophy to drown out the cries of those who are being killed under our windows. We can decide that there's nothing we can do, or perhaps that any effort to help will only make things worse in the long run. We can focus on the very, very long run where we're more concerned about the threat from artificial intelligence than the immediate deaths of people in our neighborhoods. Uh, we can focus our energy instead on our usual work in epistemology and metaphysics. But of course, Rousseau can't be meaning to condemn philosophy as such. I mean, after all, this really moving passage occurs in the middle of a discourse, um, which can only be classified as a work of philosophy. I think the key to making sense of this apparent condemnation of philosophy from inside a philosophical work is to refocus our attention on what we bring to philosophy as human beings maybe stop putting our hands over our ears and trying to, uh, to stifle that aspect of our humanity. If the defining feature of our discipline is that it liberates us from taking any particular doctrine or idea for granted, this is not to say that we can make any progress in it without taking a lot for granted. All arguments need to start from somewhere 
or aim at something. And different particular philosophers will bring different natural and learned starting points to the debate. The best philosophical arguments are those that are robust to challenges from many sides. And here I'm inclined to go back to the substance of Peter Thiel's worries about women. In my view, some of the most powerful philosophical challenges to libertarianism come from feminist philosophers, and it's no accident that women have been so effective in seeing the problems with theories like Robert Nozick's. So I'm thinking especially of feminist thinkers like Susan Muller Oaken, who've drawn attention to the fact, which is really salient to women, uh, that we humans have long periods of biological dependency on each other in a way that really challenges the libertarian view of humans as autonomous independent agents interacting in a really transactional way. As a philosopher, Muller Oaken constructs arguments that you don't need to be a woman to appreciate, but as a woman, she notices things that men like Nozick might be inclined to overlook as they start into philosophy. Philosophy as a discipline doesn't require taking any particular doctrine for granted, but I think better philosophy emerges from conversations between people who are inclined to take different things for granted. And I see this very clearly in my own main research area, epistemology, the philosophical study of knowledge. Epistemology is one of those areas where it can seem like a little philosophy does more harm than good. So I think human beings have a remarkable natural capacity um, to recognize states of knowledge in each other. All the natural languages of the world draw a line um, between verbs of knowing, which can attach only to truths, and verbs of thinking or believing um, that can also embrace falsehoods. We spontaneously track what other people do and don't know in the course of everyday conversation as we move back and forth between the roles of asking and telling. And we don't need philosophy for this. In fact, something strange happens when we first try to apply philosophy to gain a reflective understanding of knowledge itself. I mean, what do you really know? Do you know that you're watching a video right now or that I'm speaking? Could this be a dream? Especially in purely solitary, inward-looking investigation of the nature of knowledge, it can seem like ordinary, argumentative ways of thinking drive us towards skepticism. We can try to come up with reasons for what we believe, but any reason we produce on our own seems to be open to challenge from within in a regress that's been familiar since antiquity. Perhaps because these skeptical paths are so easily traced by those starting out in philosophy, many people assume that the standard philosophical approach to knowledge must be a negative one, that nothing is really known by the standards of philosophers. I can tell you that this is very far from the truth. Among professional epistemologists, there are virtually no skeptics at all, uh, and in part because the skeptic's position is one which conflicts so deeply with the human experience, um, which naturally drives us to philosophy. There has been remarkable recent progress in epistemology, and I think that's in large measure due to the diversity of philosophers who have participated in it from distinct starting points grounded in everything from formal mathematical modeling to um, linguistic patterns in spontaneous knowledge attribution. If a little bit of philosophy could make you feel like there can't be any such thing as knowledge, a deeper dive into it will easily reassure you that knowledge is alive and well, and there's a very robust distinction between knowing something to be the case and just happening to be right about it. Even if this is a distinction whose exact contours um, we're still working very hard to understand. I think there's political power in the notion that knowledge really exists and can be rationally defended, but I'm not sure I'd wanna say that the pursuit of philosophy stands in need of justification from its polit potential political payoff. I think that philosophical thinking has intrinsic value, and it's part of human flourishing to think in new ways about questions of fundamental importance. Philosophy isn't great because it tends to support democracy. Philosophy can be used to support anti-democratic ideals. Rather, I want to say democracy is great because it gives human beings the chance to think philosophically to practice a certain kind of self-determination, recognizing the equal rights of others to do so. The self-determination that democracy affords can be expressed in many ways, but philosophy is not the least of them. In closing, I want to take a moment to read an extremely old piece of philosophy. 
um, from a pre-democratic time. So this small philosophical passage comes from the Zhuangzi, a classic of Chinese philosophy from about 2,300 years ago. So this is roughly from the time of Plato. And it's a conversation between a duke uh, and a, a craftsman, a wheelwright, blue collar worker. Du Quan was reading up in his pavilion while wheelwright Flatty was hewing a wheel below. Putting down his hammer and ch chisel, the wheelwright ascended and asked Du Quan, sir, may I ask what sort of words you are reading? The Duke said, the words of sages. Are those sages still alive? They are dead, said the Duke. Then what you are perusing is no more than the dregs and dust of the ancients. Duke Juan replied, does a wheelwright dare to pass judgment on what his ruler reads? If you can explain yourself, well and good. If not, you shall die. Wheelwright Flatty said, I'm looking at it from the point of view of my own profession. In hewing a wheel, if I spin too slowly and make the hub too loose, it attaches to the crossbar, but not firmly. If I spin quickly and make it tight, I have to struggle to attach it and it never really gets all the way in. I have to make it not too loose and not too tight, my hand feeling it and my mind constantly responsive to it. I cannot explain this with my mouth. And yet there's a certain knack to the procedure. I can't even get my own son to grasp it, so even he has no way to learn it from me. Thus, I'm already 70 years old and still here busily hewing wheels as an old man. The ancients died, and that which they could not transmit died along with them. So I say that what you, my lord, are perusing is just the dust and dregs of the ancients, nothing more. I find an exquisite instability here when I read this passage with my students. On the one hand, we can have a strong sense of what this wheelwright means. There's something about his practical knowledge of crafting the wheel that he can't put in words, something about his special personal intelligence that will die with him. On the other hand, the author of this text has somehow put exactly this into words. These words are alive for us from a very distant starting point. The text that we're reading is from a long dead author, but it's not a dead text. It's not just dust and dregs. The text derives part of its literary power from the fact that it depicts a conversation taking place between two socially very unequal people, one of whom is speaking his mind under immediate threat of death, but very much as a philosophical peer to the other. I think there's a lot we could say philosophically about this text and about the line between practical and theoretical knowledge. But I want to close by just expressing my appreciation for it as a piece of philosophy that has value in itself. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer, for the excellent uh, talk. I, I know we uh, don't have a ton of time today, but I hope you don't mind if I uh, follow up with maybe a question or two. Sure. Yeah. Um, so I guess I want to ask, sort of circle back around to sort of the diversity of philosophy and the free thinking it provides, um, having a philosophical education, and then potentially the relationship between the methods of philosophy and then the ends of philosophy. So one way I like to think about philosophy is that in, it, in at least one sort of story about its origins is that it's the pursuit of the good. Uh, and so I wonder if the pursuit of the good in some ways checks the method of philosophy so that although there is meant to be this freedom of thought, if the end is to pursue the good, does that somehow curb or potentially limit freedom of thought? Or what I guess is the relationship between the method and the ends? I'm not saying, I, I don't have an answer one way or the other, but this seemed to be a dilemma almost you were setting up between philosophy that it has certain ends and that there are these methods and they might be in tension with each other. So I don't know if there's, there's, if you have a way to sort of respond to that or what is the relationship between these two seemingly disparate parts of philosophy? I think this is a really great question and it opens up the possibility of another kind of avenue you could take back against 
the worry that philosophy can be um, can be used against a democracy, for example, you might want to say that can't really be philosophy. That can't be the true love of wisdom. That's going to be pseudo philosophy. You know, philosophy, the real thing, um, has to be devoted to to the good, to human flourishing. Um, but I, I think um, I think that's that's actually a there, there's there, there's something to that and I, and I, I want to think that you know philosophy in the in the highest and purest sense might um might be like that for us but but I also want to think that we don't get to exercise philosophy in its full purity as flawed human beings um that what we can fund at any given time is not um philosophy as such we can fund philosophy departments um which can include, faculty and students with all sorts of agendas not necessarily directed at the good as long as it's like kind of an active open question what the good is um we can't um politically just put funding to towards the good as if that was something uh something completely uncontroversial we have to um what we what we can do is um is fund disciplines and institutions that allow us a certain kind of freedom of thought which will carry us where it will um but we can't determine in advance that this is going to uh going to make something uh make something good happen um so 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 i suppose philosophy can um sort of be divided into uh in, 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 into a couple different parts there's the the practical, fundable institution in which actual human beings can participate. And then there's the ideal towards which we, uh, which, towards which we might strive, but it's very controversial what that would be. Right. Um, so, so as long as we haven't figured out what the good is, <laughs> it's very important to keep the debate open and to have philosophers thinking in all kinds of different ways about this. Absolutely, Aaron. Yeah. Beautiful yeah. Foot. Uh, yeah. I have um, one other sort of thought, which may be a bit fanciful or poetic when listening to your talk, and it's that Ukrainians are fighting for philosophy. Um, and I, I, I know some Ukrainian philosophers, and I think they kind of think this way. But what I mean by that is they're fighting for freedom of thought. Yes. Um, and, and what's interesting, at least to me, that also came out in your talk is the relationship between freedom of thought and democracy. Um, that, that philosophy might be able, philosophers might be able to defend all kinds of different positions. There are Russian philosophers famously defending fascism. Um, and yet there seems to be some connection here between philosophy and democracy or freedom um, insofar as democracy requires a certain amount of freedom of thought. And I just wonder, since you kind of touched on it, maybe just unpack this idea of the relationship between philosophy or freedom of thought and democracy, because um, I think you touched on it, but I just wanted to hear more about it. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's a really difficult question. Um, and mm -hmm. I mean, one thing I'd like to say is that uh, philosophy involves rational persuasion, rational persuasion of actual other human beings. And um, it doesn't work by just, um, you know, stipulating some idea that you as an individual find powerful. Um, and to the extent that philosophy involves rational persuasion of other human beings, it's going to be engaging their um, their rational intelligence, and it can do so better if they meet you as equals who are at liberty to exercise their own freedom of thought. I mean, sometimes mm -hmm. I like to think, you know, I love um, freedom, democracy, philosophy, but not necessarily in that order, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and then you can start wondering, like, oh, if I had to choose, I mean, here I am in Canada, I, I don't, I, I don't have to choose, but would I prefer? Uh, to be in a society where I was ab absolutely free and democratic society, which just happened to have no philosophy in it, or, or an autocratic society in which there was, you know, beautiful government funded free philosophy every afternoon for a couple hours, you know, um, coffee's always hot at the at the workshops, you can you can say whatever you want during philosophy time in the afternoon, as long as you go back to, you know, unthinkingly accepting the orders of the autocrat at 4pm. Um, and I kind of think like both of those hypotheticals are kind of kind of ridiculous, right? Like there's no way an, aut an autocracy could tolerate genuine freedom of thought amongst its people. Um, there's no way it could suppress um, the desire for those people to see uh, a better 
situation in terms of their power relations. But I think there's also no way in which you could have an absolutely free and democratic society in which philosophy never emerged. Um, and I don't necessarily mean academic philosophy. I mean, the kind of philosophy that you have um, in podcasts, in late night conversations, sometimes even just, uh, you know, overheard at the bus stop. Uh, mm -hmm. You have uh, moments where people are asking themselves, asking each other, um, what what gives this meaning? What makes our lives what makes our lives valuable? Um, mm -hmm. And uh, and I think that's um, an irrepressible part of, uh, of of humanity, and it's something that is definitely going to flourish uh, in any free and democratic society as a result. Well, great. I think that's an excellent place to end this conversation, Jennifer. I really appreciate you uh, speaking at this benefit event. I also appreciate everybody who is participating and watching at home. I encourage you to contribute what you can to this initiative. Um, we'll put some information up for you in a moment. Uh, and Jennifer, just again, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Aaron. It was absolutely an honor to do this.
Thanks everyone for attending this benefit event for the Ukrainian Academy. The title of the conference is What Good is Philosophy? The Role of the Academy in a Time of Crisis. And it's meant to generate support for establishing a center for civic engagement at Kiev Mohila Academy. This center will provide assistance for students, scholars, and publicly engaged academics in Ukraine who are doing fabulous work in very difficult circumstances. Uh, I encourage you to give what you can, and after the talk, we'll put up some information on the slide so you know what to do um, to contribute to this initiative. Um, that said, it's my pleasure to welcome Kasim Kassam um, today. Kasim is professor of philosophy at the University of Warwick and a fellow of the British Academy uh, and an honorary fellow of Keeble College, Oxford. Uh, he's written seven books, including Extremism, a Philosophical Analysis, and Vices of the Mind. Uh, Kasim is going to talk to us today about liberation philosophy. And uh, yeah, I just want to say thanks very much for coming, Kasim, and over to you. Well, thanks for the invitation to give this talk, and thanks to the audience for, for tuning in. Yeah. Um, so the title of my talk is uh, Liberation Philosophy. And I want to start with a related uh, idea, which is the idea of liberation theology. Uh, so liberation theology is, is, a, is, a, is a theological movement that uh, was very powerful in, in Latin America, as people will know. Uh, one of the leading lights is a Peruvian, uh, Gustavo Gutierrez, uh, who uh, published a very dense book called A Theology of Liberation, uh, which he, and, and he defines it like this. Um, liberation theology is a theology which does not stop with reflecting on the world, but rather tries to be part of the process through which the world is transformed. Uh, and uh, in, a, in a somewhat similar vein, the Boff brothers, two distinguished liberation theologians, liberation theology, they say, was born when faith confronted the injustice done to the poor. Uh, so that's liberation theology. So you might think that, that, that you know, perhaps by analogy, we might consider something called liberation philosophy. And indeed, uh, in, in Latin America, in Argentina in particular, there is, a, there is a movement of philosophers who think of themselves as practicing liberation philosophy. So if you take the analogy with theology seriously, then you might think that liberation philosophy would be a philosophy which does not stop with reflecting on the world, but rather tries to be part of the process through which the world is transformed. Uh, now, that's the idea that I want to explore uh, in, this, in this little uh, talk. And I think the first thing, the first question that arises about that view is, how exactly does the world need to be transformed? Um, in, the, in, the, in the Latin American context in which liberation theology uh, became prominent, there were problems of imperialism, of, uh, of poverty, mass inequality, military dictatorship. It's pretty easy to see in that context why you might think that philosophy couldn't and shouldn't remain silent about such matters, but needed to needed to engage. Uh, but looking at looking at uh, philosophy, uh, particularly in the uh, pr privileged academic world of um, of Europe and America, um, what is the transformation that it seeks to bring about? Um, if if it is indeed supposed to be transformative in some sense, that's the first question. Uh, the second question, I think, is this. I mean, even if you think that philosophy should try to be part of the process through which the world is transformed, is it really possible for philosophy to do that? I mean, is, it, is it possible? And, 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 and is it its business to do that, even if it is possible to do that? Um, I mean, there is the view that philosophy has its own questions, its own concerns, um, uh, that, that are, as it were, purely theoretical, and that it's not really its place. Um, to engage with the world in the way that liberation theologians try to engage with the world. So I wanted to start off with those two issues. Okay, so the first issue is what are the problems to which liberation philosophy is supposed to be the solution? So certainly if you think of the problems facing the world today, I mean problems of imperial conquest, um, extremism, poverty, injustice, um, you might think that these are all serious matters that need to be tackled um, and, 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 and so one shouldn't give the impression that somehow the world is fine as it is and there's nothing that needs to change. Of course, there are many things that need to change. 
Um, so these would be some of the transformations that you might look for. Um, but then it becomes really obscure what role philosophy has to play in dealing with these issues. If you're thinking about the problem of, of imperial conquest, um, I, I mean, philosophy might, of course, um, join in the condemnation of this, but how is it uh, going to contribute in any way to, um, uh, to, tackling, to tackling this issue? So I think if we want to pursue this idea of liberation philosophy, we need to have a somewhat more modest um, conception of it. Um, and here I want to uh, quote something that the philosopher Louis Anthony once said in, in an article in which she tries to characterize uh, what she calls feminist philosophy. And here's what she says. She says, we need to remember that part of what unites philosophers who choose to characterize their own work as feminist is the conception that philosophy ought to matter, that it ought to make a positive contribution to the construction of a more just, humane and nurturing world than the one we currently inhabit. And that's the sort of view of the ambitions of liberation philosophy that I want to pursue. So it's not about you know, reversing, reversing imperial conquests, it's not about um, alleviating, alleviating poverty, but at least um, seeking to make some contribution to as Louise Anthony puts it, the construction of a more just and humane and nurturing world. And the overarching vision of this type of philosophy is the idea that philosophy ought to matter, it ought to make a difference in the world. And this is something to which philosophers ought to pay serious um, attention. And then the, the challenge is to work out how philosophers can do this. Um, so even if you like the idea of philosophy doing what Louise Anthony describes, you, you still need to respond to the challenge of explaining how philosophy can do this. Um, okay, so that's the challenge that I want to respond to uh, in, in these very, um, very brief um, remarks. It's worth pointing out also, I think, that in order to respond to this challenge, philosophy needs to transform itself. It's not just about transforming the world, but also about transforming itself. And indeed, some people understand the idea of liberatory philosophy as liberation from philosophy, or at least liberation from the way that philosophy has been done. So the thought is that, that philosophy, as, we, as, as many of us learnt it, has its own um, its own questions, its own concerns that have no worldly relevance at all. Um, and uh, the idea is that uh, we should just be focusing on these questions, however abstract and however technical, and we don't, we shouldn't really concern ourselves with anything, uh, with anything else. So part of what uh, liberation philosophy would involve would mean, would be to transform that vision of philosophy, to think of philosophy in a different way. Not to, not to rule out the possibility of philosophy addressing its own abstract questions, but also to, also to pursue the idea of philosophy being a subject that matters, that ought to matter in just the way that um, I have been um, describing it. Okay, well, if that is a line that one wishes to pursue, then I think one's going to confront opposition from a kind of more traditional view of philosophy. So the traditionalist, I think, might protest um, that what I am describing is neither necessary nor even possible. So here are some things that a traditionalist might say. Take philosophy of physics or philosophy of mathematics. I mean, it's just absurd to suppose that a philosopher of physics can or should be contributing to the construction of a more just and humane world. I mean, that's an absurd idea. So the first thing that needs to be said is, of course, that's right. I mean, of course, the claim is not that every branch of philosophy um, should, be, uh, should be liberatory. Um, the, the, the claim is rather that some branches of philosophy, including some perhaps un unexpected, surprising areas of philosophy like epistemology, might have a significant contribution to make um, to the uh, liberatory project that I've been describing. Another, another potential source of opposition, I think, might be from the kind of philosopher who says, uh, for the questions that philosophers ask on the whole have no direct practical application. Uh, and this is something that as philosophers, we should be uh, not only content to live with, but we should not be embarrassed by. Uh, so the philosopher, Timothy Williamson, who I believe is also going to be giving a talk, uh, once said, um, um, said the following, he made the point that uh, most philosophical questions lack direct application. 
And he imagines a philosopher being interested in the question, are people events? Um, are people events? I need to repeat this question because of its oddity. Uh, now, one thing that Williamson says when he gives this question as an example, he says, well, what's wrong with simply wanting to know whether people are events or not? Uh, now, that, I think, gives expression to the kind of view of philosophy and philosophical questions that I want to call into question. OK, so one, so one thing that you might say about the question, are people events, is if one is to devote oneself to answering that question, if intellectual horsepower is to be devoted to, 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 de to dealing with this issue, one would at least need to understand why this question is being asked. Um, so the first thing to say to someone who asks, are people events, I think would be, well, why do you want to know? What exactly uh, is the nature of your interest in this question? And how would we advance um, uh, um, our understanding of ourselves and our place in the world by answering this question? Now, I think a kind of reaction to that is sometimes to say, well, some questions are very interesting in and of themselves. You know, we don't really need to, we don't need to show that these questions have any pragmatic payoff. And that's what I'm resisting. I think, of course, there are questions that are like that, the questions that are asked by philosophers of physics and mathematics. But I think that, that, that the idea that um, it's just OK to say, I'm, I'm, in, I'm going to spend my time asking whether people are events and it doesn't really, it's not fair or not relevant to ask um, why one should be interested in that question. That I think is what I am um, 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 calling into question. So I think one way to ask this, to, to address this issue would be to ask about the relevance of relevance. Um, so, so I have really been making the case for a kind of relevant philosophy, as you, as you might put it. And the purest opposition to that would be to say, well, relevance isn't relevant for philosophy. Philosophy has its own agenda and its own concerns, the questions that they ask might be relevant to the world, they might not be relevant to the world, but it doesn't really matter. It's philosophy after all. Um, and, and, and the view that I want to promote is a view that focuses much, much more on questions of practical application, a view that actually takes seriously the need to explain why wasn't one is interested in these questions. What good would it do us as a species to have an answer to the question, are people events? I'm not denying uh, uh, the possibility that it might be. It might, that might turn out to be a deep, uh, not only a deep question, but a relevant question. I mean, maybe if you thought people are events, this would change our conception of ourselves. And that might have, um, that might have real world consequences, real world significance. But nevertheless, I think um, the question, why should we be interested in these issues, is a question that needs to be um, uh, needs to be um, addressed. So the next issue then is, supposing you followed me so far and supposing you're happy with the idea that, um, uh, as Louise Anthony puts it, philosophy ought to matter. And matter not just to philosophers, but ought to matter outside academia. So then you might get someone who says, well, yes, it would be nice if philosophy mattered outside academia. It would be nice if philosophy could contribute to the construction of a more just and nurturing um, world, as Louis Anthony describes it. But what reason is there for thinking that philosophy can possibly influence the world in these ways? Um, so this is, a, this is a kind of pessimism now, which says that, which says that, 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 that what I'm describing is a kind of fantasy, the fantasy of, of, of a theoretical philosopher um, making a contribution to the world. I mean, of course, there are areas, there are issues that philosophers have written about that clearly are of real world relevance. I'm thinking, for example, a philosophical work on the morality of torture. Clearly, that's an area that's of, um, of real world significance. But what kind of influence is it possible for philosophy um, to have? Um, and and I, I, I'd, like to, I'd like to simply propose um, three models of philosophical influence, three ways in which philosophy can make the contribution that I think philosophy should be trying to make. Um, the first way uh, is, is what I call the direct influence model. So, 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 I mean, in a way, this is just stating the blind and the obvious, but if you look at the history of philosophy, of course, philosophers have had huge influence um, on uh, on the, on, on the world. I mean, you need to think of Rousseau's influence on the French Revolution. Uh, you need to think of Marx's influence uh, on, uh, on the Russian Revolution. 
um, and there are many there are many such examples. I think what these examples show is that the influence of philosophy is not always benign. Uh, philosophy can can affect the world for good or ill, and you know you could argue that its influence has been you know uh, for ill more than it has been for good. But if the issue is is it possible for philosophy to exert a kind of influence um, um, on the world? Of course it can, and, and and indeed has done. But but you might think, well, yes, okay. But these are these are not examples that are pertinent to the average working philosopher. I mean, which of us can aspire to the influence of a Rousseau or a Marx on the world? So so we, I, I think we need to we need to scale our ambitions back a little more and think more realistically about the kind of influence or impact that philosophy can have. Uh, and so the second model that I have in mind, um, which I contrast with the direct influence model, is what I call the permeation model. And this, I think, is much more to the point. So when I talk about the permeation model, I talk about the way that philosophical ideas can permeate culture, can permeate political and other forms of discourse. And by permeating um, um, various kinds of discourse and indeed activities and practices can have an influence and in some cases, a positive um, influence. Uh, so let me give some examples of that. Let me give some examples. Um, so one example that I, that, I, that, that I like very much is the idea of epistemic injustice. Now, the idea of epistemic injustice was, was, was introduced uh, by uh, uh, Miranda Fricker, um, a, a British philosopher now based in the, U in the US. Um, and it, it's basically the idea of wronging somebody in their capacity as a knower. Um, so there are various examples of epistemic justice that she, she, uh, that she talks about. One form of epistemic injustice is testimonial injustice. Um, where, it, to use one of her examples, somebody's testimony, somebody's a report of a certain event is ignored because the person telling you about this event um, um, is, belongs to a, um, a group which is the object of, pre of social prejudice of one sort or another. Uh, another kind of uh, in, uh, epistemic injustice she talks about is hermeneutical injustice, which is the injustice that results from people not having the resources to make sense of their own experience. So she talks about um, the experience of women who lacked some of the concepts that were subsequently developed by feminists um, as an example of hermeneutical um, in injustice. What I, the point I wanna make about this is that these ideas of epistemic injustice have in fact had a considerable influence outside the academy. Uh, so this is a classic example of some ideas that originated with a theoretical philosopher actually affecting and being, being made use of in a positive way by practitioners in many other fields. Um, so uh, two areas where I think this idea has been taken up and has had, uh, I think, a positive influence are healthcare and social work. Um, there is now a considerable body, body of, of, of not just theoretical literature, but practical literature in those two fields that um, explores the reality and implications of the phenomenon of epistemic justice in these sorts of contexts. So here's a kind of simple example. Supposing um, you're trying to look at interactions between a medical practitioner and her patients. Um, so one familiar phenomenon is that is that the seriousness with which the practitioner takes what the patient says is affected by all sorts of considerations, including considerations having to do with the social class of the patient. Um, so the pronouncements of, a, of, a, of an upper middle class educated patient are perhaps going to be taken more seriously than the, than, than, than the pronouncements of someone in a less privileged position. And this is potentially a source of testimonial injustice in interactions between patient and medical practitioner. And as this idea has started to permeate thinking about medical practice, it's actually helped practitioners to think about this issue, which is an extremely serious issue. Um, and, and, and that's just one kind of simple example. In the area of social work, again, um, there has been a, 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 a greater sensitivity to this issue. And I think this has been a, a positive development. So I just give this as an example of a way in which an idea from 
in, in an area of kind of theoretical philosophy um, has in fact um, uh, had, a, had a positive real world impact by permeating practices, um, uh, practices outside the academia. Um, the third model um, of um, how philosophy might be relevant that I want to dis describe. So the first model was the direct influence model. The second was the permeation model. And the third model is the empowerment model. So this is the idea that philosophy can empower us by giving us concepts that make enable us to make better sense of our own experience, uh, including our, uh, our so experience of social interactions. So this connects with Fricker's idea of um, hermeneutical uh, justice and hermeneutical injustice. Uh, uh, an, an, an example that I like to use in this context is the example of gaslighting. So, 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 so here's a concept such that when you actually come to understand what gaslighting is, you're in a position to understand whether and when you yourself are being gaslighted. And that can actually make a difference to you. It can make a difference to your position, to your position in the world. It can make a difference to your ability to make sense of reality and your own experience. So these are just some examples, I think, of how philosophy, even theoretical philosophy, even areas of philosophy like epistemology, um, can actually have the positive impact um, that I was describing as part and parcel of liberation philosophy. Now, of course, for philosophy to have that impact, there's one thing that it must do, and that is it must learn to communicate these ideas clearly to a wider audience. People who are not professional philosophers are going to find it extremely difficult to read um, work in philosophy journals about gaslighting or um, hermeneutical injustice or testimonial injustice. So I think there is an obligation on philosophers who work on these topics and who care about making a difference, who think that it's relevant whether they, their work is relevant. It is an obligation, I think, on them to write clearly and to develop the skill of, of speaking to a wider audience, speaking to an audience outside academia. And that's really the note that I, that, that, that I want to end on. Um, I think I've made the case for a kind of liberatory approach to philosophy. And I, and, and I want to just emphasize that, that, that this really calls for a, a fundamental transformation in, in how philosophy itself operates as, as a discipline, a change, at least a change in emphasis when it comes to the issues that it addresses, but also a greater willingness to communicate uh, with, a, with a wider audience, particularly to communicate ideas that are relevant and useful to a wider audience, as I think many philosophical ideas are. Uh, I'll stop there. Okay. Thanks very much, Kasim. I really appreciate you uh, participating in this event. And uh, as someone who's edited a fair bit of public philosophy, uh, I appreciate the point at which you ended your talk. Um, I suppose I'll start with maybe the general idea with which you began. So the connection between liberation theology and liberation philosophy. In some ways, you started with this uh, movement that takes place in Latin America and their aims or their ends of the theologians are very obvious that there's obvious poverty here and we're going to work to eliminate that. But I wonder, I guess, what is the relationship between the kind of philosophy you're imagining and the ends with which we're supposed to pursue. Does philosophy have a role to play in sketching out those ends or defending those ends? Or I guess in some ways, uh, you know, if we're taking this less ambitious place, like presumably Marx and the liberation theologians had something in common. Um, but like you said, we're not Marx or most of us are not Marx. Uh, and so we have these much smaller aims and ambitions. And so in that case, where it might not be so obvious what the ends are in this sort of transformative project, what is the relationship between philosophy and the ends these liberation philosophers are supposed to pursue? Or philosophers generally are supposed to pursue if they want to contribute to this transformation to a more just world? Well, that's a great question. And I, th I, I think the answer is that, is that the identification of the ends 
themselves is part of the liberation philosophy project. So one might talk you know, about a concern with justice or social justice, uh, but of course it's the job of the philosopher to explain what that, what that means in the context in which they, in which they operate. Um, so, 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 I, so, so as, I, as I see it, the role is both in the, it plays a role both in articulating, articulating and defending certain ends rather than certain other ends, as well as articulating a way in which it can contribute to the achievement of those ends. Um, so if you think of, if you think of um, epistemic injustice as a, as, a, as a real world phenomenon, as, it, as, as I believe it undoubtedly is, so you might think, well, so one end, one end that you might have as a philosopher is the end of combating um, epistemic injustice. Um, now, of course, that is an end that would need defending, it would need explaining, and of course, you would also need to tell some story about how you're going to reach how you're going to reach this end. Um, so there's a there's a there's a piece of terminology that's used a lot by social scientists. This is the idea of what they call a theory of change. So if you're introducing an if you're introducing a social policy with a view to bringing about some outcome, um, you need a theory which explains how that policy is going to reach that outcome. And I think as philosophers, we also need a theory of change. We need we need a theory of change to explain how what we do. Is, is going to achieve the ends that we have um, identified and articulated. Mm -hmm. So this, I think, would um, be a fairly significant change in the questions or issues that philosophers work on, because oftentimes you, at least let's say in political philosophy and potentially moral philosophy, there's a discussion of the ends, but less about the means. But do you think philosophers are qualified to think about the means in the way that, say, somebody doing political science or economics who has a different kind of specialization in what's involved in social institutions in a way that philosophers don't? I mean, is this is, is, is philosophy getting beyond its area of expertise is maybe a way to put this question? Maybe. But I think this this brings me to something else that I would want to say, which is to make mm -hmm. the case for a thorough, thoroughly interdisciplinary approach to these issues. So I, of course, I think that philosophy on it, working in isolation is not going to be able to answer these questions, but it needs to collaborate with, uh, with, 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 other, with other disciplines. Um, I, I mean, I think, it's, I, think it's, I think it's foolish to suppose uh, that, that, that philosophy can on its own do things, do, do the things I was describing, but I think it can make a significant contribution to doing the things I was describing, as long as it's willing to work with other, with other relevant disciplines, whether it's sociologists, economists, uh, me medical doctors, there's a wide range of uh, other, other disciplines and practices with which we need to, with which we need to collaborate and communicate. Okay. okay. Uh, I'm all for that, Kasim, and uh, I want to um, thank you again for participating in this benefit event for the Ukrainian Academy. Uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, I'm sure my Ukrainian colleagues do too. Um, I want to thank everybody for attending, uh, and I encourage everyone to contribute what you can to this initiative. Um, it makes a real difference to people on the ground in Ukraine. And uh, yeah, just thanks again, Kasim. Uh, I appreciate your time. Thank you. It's been a it's been a pleasure. Great. Thanks. Thank you.
Thanks everyone for attending this benefit event for the Ukrainian Academy. The title of the conference is What Good is Philosophy? The Role of the Academy in a Time of Crisis. The conference is meant to generate support for students, scholars, and publicly engaged academics in Ukraine who are doing excellent work in very difficult circumstances. We'll put some information up on the screen after the talk, uh, and we encourage you to use this information to contribute what you can, again, to supporting the Ukrainian Academy. Uh, that said, it's my great pleasure and honor to introduce Vladimir Yermolenko. Vladimir is a Ukrainian philosopher, journalist, and writer. He is the president of Penn Ukraine, the analytics director at Internews Ukraine, and the editor-in-chief of ukraineworld.org, a multimedia project in English about Ukraine. He is also an associate professor at Kiev Mohila Academy, and he has written numerous articles in Ukrainian and international media, including The Economist, Le Monde, The Financial Times, The New York Times, and Newsweek. His texts and interviews have been published in Ukrainian, English, French, German, Polish, Italian, Russian, Dutch, Norwegian, Czech, Greek, Chinese, and a host of other languages. He is also the proud father of three daughters. Uh, today, Vladimir will be talking to us about thinking in dark times. Again, Vladimir, it's a pleasure and honor to have you here, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Aaron. It's a great pleasure to be with you and to be uh, on this conference. And I think it's a great idea, actually, to make this conference and to support uh, the Ukrainian academic life in Ukraine because we understand that many Ukrainian academics uh, have actually are actually abroad and get support abroad, but it's there is a very big need to support Ukrainian academics inside Ukraine. Many of my colleagues from the academia are actually on the front line. Some of them have, uh, are not with us anymore. They they passed away. They were killed by by the Russian troops. This is the reality in which we are living, and we should understand this reality. Uh, now, my the topic of my speech is what is it like thinking in the dark times? What does it mean? And it kind of a, makes an echo to uh, the podcast series that uh, I have launched within uh, our podcast, Explaining Ukraine, which is one of the widest listened podcasts in English about Ukraine. So the idea was to not stop thinking even during the dark during dark times. Uh, when I when I shared this idea once with uh, Marcy Shore, professor at Yale University, she said, "Look, it it refers to Hannah Arendt's book, People in Dark Times." And I said, "Yeah, I, di I didn't think about this. Indeed, there is a reference to it. So there is probably a parallel uh, of our time, of course, with with the time of of Hannah Arendt's reflection. And for me, actually, the the idea." of light is is very interesting and very important and the idea of darkness as well because i do think that mm, different epochs different times have certain relations to light and darkness and uh, uh we we can we can say that there are some epochs like renaissance uh, or enlightenment or the second half of the 20th century which were highlighting the idea of light transparency and um, you know open open space open perspective that everything we're bringing everything to light we have this kind of an idea that light is a norm and darkness is a is a deviation but there are other epochs uh, like baroque for example or romanticism the 17th century or the 19th century in which uh, the reflection starts from the opposite. It starts from the idea that probably the darkness is our norm and light is an exception. Light is something that we have, uh, which which comes not very often, uh, which, which we should sh cherish, but which comes not often, and which can go away very quickly. And for me, one of the metaphors is this Baroque painting, the chiaroscuro painting, of Caravaggio, of Rembrandt, of von Honthorst, 
of uh, Georges de la Tour. Uh, this is an important metaphor for me because I do think that there is something in emotion of this chiaroscuro. It's not just a technique of painting. There is some emotion in this, which says that light is, is a rarity, light is a deficit. We actually start with the darkness and inside darkness we start, we start thinking. And of course, this kind of thinking comes during difficult times. We understand how difficult the 16th and 17th century were for Europe uh, or the early 19th century, or for that matter, the, the European years in the early 20th century, where also we, we can see this, you know, um, kind of a doubt that the light is, is a norm. And therefore, for example, my first book uh, in Ukrainian was actually dedicated to Walter Benjamin. And I kind of uh, I kind of uh, knew that there is something in Benjamin which goes beyond this adaptation of Benjamin, which was uh, which was popular in 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 the times when I was writing the book, because the adaptation was very much postmodernist. The adaptation was that, okay, let's look at Walter Benjamin as kind of a first a deconstructivist or first uh, first Derrida before Derrida. And I, I thought there was something wrong with this because Benjamin was really, for me, always a Baroque thinker, a thinker of the of those years of of Chiaroscuro, where he actually considers uh, truth as a as a deficit, as a rarity, uh, blitzhaftig, as he said as a kind of a lightening uh, through the darkness. And I think this is very important. Actually, we should not underestimate this because many big thinkers are actually thinking in, 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 in uh, you no know, start thinking in this, uh, in this moment. We, we should probably think about Descartes as a, as a Baroque philosopher who actually says that, look, we're in the darkness. We are, you know, played by the the bad genius uh the the bad the bad spirit who plays with us and therefore we don't know whether uh, what are what is the, the right path to take and therefore we we have to invent something like methodos or something like this and uh suddenly we realize that the origins of that visibly rational philosophy of descartes are, are actually much more existential than than we used to think and therefore, I do think that there is something in, in Ukraine right now which, which we should pay attention to. That is this big experience of facing the war and facing the fragility of life and facing the, the death, actually, which, uh, which, which is very painful, but at the same time is, might be an origin of thinking, origin of, of, of thinking, uh, and of literature and of, poet, of poetry and art. The poetry which is now produced by Ukrainian poets um, is an incredible thing. Uh, many, many names like Sergei Zhadan or Katarina Kruk or Halina Kruk or Katarina Kalitko or uh, Katarina Babkina or uh, Yulia Musakovska or Paolo Korobchuk or Svetlana Pavalaeva, lots of other names. Uh, gives us very strong, strong poetry, and this is poetry because it's much, much more than poetry. It's it's a strong literature because it's much more than literature because it's much more than just work with words. It's it's it goes be, beyond that. Um, I do hope that uh, the current current epoch, current period, will also give us you know, some impetus for, for a new thinking and a new reflection. And I keep thinking about this. I keep thinking about the basic concepts of, uh, uh, of philosophy, the basic concepts of, uh, of, uh, of thinking. And I do hope that uh, this period will also produce something new in the Ukrainian philosophy as well, and maybe already producing. I also think that... Um, the current time, the time of the war, shows how important ideas is uh, are. I, I agree with uh, I agree with Tim Snyder, who repeats saying that uh, actually one of the causes of this war are bad ideas. And uh, 
the first episode of of this serious thinking in dark times i was happy to make it with timothy snyder and he expresses this thought in in this episode very clearly and i th i think we're underestimated how bad ideas actually can peel, kill people how morally bad ideas can kill people they are not innocent at all they're not just words so the idea that for example russia is an empire that needs to expand and ukraine is non-existent state and uh, the past of ukraine is actually the the past of russia history of ukraine is actually history of russia is a bad idea is bad done by bad historians but when it turns into ideology it turns into a weapon because once you say uh, ukraine does not exist or doesn't have a right to exist the next step is to say okay we should eliminate the idea of ukraine and all the people who bear this idea and this is the di direct step to to genocide what is happening right now so i do think that ideas play a big role ideas persist mm, they go beyond material material uh, material reality of our lives and therefore we should be very attentive to ideas i do think that um, there was some kind of a devaluation of ideas in the past decades uh, both in Eastern Europe and in the in the in the Western world, uh, this was the role of postmodernism. Maybe this was the role of certain relativization of ideas. This was actually a, a thought that ideas are inter interexchangeable; that they can be uh, one idea can replace another one. I think it is profoundly wrong, and therefore we should really pay attention to ideas very much. So the, the the thoughts that I'm, I'm I'm thinking about and how the the current situation is actually leads us to to maybe to rethinking many things. Um, I will I will try to dwell upon them and I will try to share you with you those um, those those ideas that I have about uh, about words and concepts that we are accustomed to. First, I think. One of the key thing we need to think about is the idea of life. Life has become also during peace, peaceful time. Life, life has become a something banal, and um, but at the same time during the war, when you're facing the death, uh, when you're facing and, and when the death is no longer an abstract word, you understand how life is fragile, how our societies are fragile how our physical bodies are fragile uh, how our culture is fragile how everything can be undone very quickly how the belief in the inevitability of history is also the wrong belief and uh, i think this is very very important to 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 think about this that actually uh war is of course a, a, an evil an absolute evil but when you when you have no choice but to face the war, the face death and destruction, you you kind of see how you can cherish life in a new way, how you can you can value the living beings in a new way. And one of the examples for me, for example, is how we see the attention in Ukraine right now, not only to the lives of people, we see an enormous rituals around the dead soldiers um, and it, this comes from as early as from from Euromaidan we see these ceremonies in which uh, in in when a village is burying a dead every village every dweller of the village goes on the street and 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 goes with with this person recently for example when we have uh, famous people famous heroes dead we see all the social networks talking about these people like several days ago uh, actually yesterday there was the death of uh, a very very prominent ukrainian very young soldier an officer uh, with the nickname da vinci um, life is uh, is very fragile and but at the same time it's it's very much cherished and um uh, we've just returned from Nikopol, from the town six kilometers from uh, the Russian troops, those famous nuclear power plant, uh, Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, 
the biggest in Europe, which is occupied by the Russians. And uh, we've met a, a woman called Olena, who is taking care of the shelter for dogs, for pets, about 250 pets that she is actually taking care of despite the regular shelling by the Russian army, despite the, the danger of the major nuclear disaster six kilometers from her. And, and this is repetitive stories. We, he, we see that many, many times, how people in these difficult times, they actually extend, they, they care for life well beyond humans. And I think this is very important. Another conclusion about life is that actually life as a biological, biological fact is much less, not, not I mean, life is not full if it's if it's not uh filled with with the sense with the meaning with values uh with for example with the value of freedom as as recently said by uh, tyra a uh, ukrainian famous paramedic who spent much time in russian captivity life without freedom doesn't matter it doesn't matter for ukrainians and we see that actually many times and uh, actually we we come back to the old idea of dignity if 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 we try to uncover the idea of dignity back in the roman times we understand that dignity is some is, is the continuation of life beyond life is is something uh which is not material which goes beyond your biology but which you cherish no less than your biological life or even more than your biological life and one of the stories Ukraine is discussing right now is the story of a Ukrainian soldier, a Ukrainian prisoner of, of war, uh, who was told by the Russian soldiers to uh, to dig his own grave and then to uh, take away the symbols, the Ukrainian symbols from his uniform. And he refused to do that. And he said, glory to Ukraine. And he was shot down at the very moment. So this dignity that you're not afraid of saying glory to Ukraine when you're facing the enemy who are ready to shoot, uh, who are ready to kill you. This is something really, really incredible. And this is something that this word dignity, which is, which becomes very, very practical, which becomes very material. The second idea is that death is not a metaphor. Death is not just a word. I, I, I was kind of a sick to to see how the word death became popular in the 20th century. We talked about death of culture, death of modernity, death of idealism, death of metaphysics. And uh, in all that, we kind of played with the word death. I think it became less scary for us. It became something, something very far away with which we can play. For us right now, death is not an abstract word. It's a physical death. It's a is a real death is is a void that you feel when you when your close people die when your husbands die when your kids die when your when your parents die when your friends die the third idea is that i i do think that we need to think more deeply about evil and not only just about evil with all the concepts around it like banality of evil or something like that uh, actually, the the ideas of Hannah Arendt of banality of evil are confirmed by this war uh, as well. But at the same time, I think we can go beyond that. Uh, but what what it is important is that evil that we are facing right now in Ukraine is a, not just an evil; it's a repetitive evil. It's an evil which was not condemned. It it was it, it it's an evil that was not uh, not judged. Uh, it was evil that was not punished. It's an evil that enjoys its impunity. Uh, and I think this kind of a vicious circle of evil uh, is very important thought that we need to uh, also to think about, that evil enjoys when it is not punished, because then it can, it can say that, look, I am a new norm. I am a new norm. I am not a killer. I am a judge. This is what happens in in Russia and Soviet Union, if we think about who Putin is, Putin is the heir of those killers of NKVD by NKVD, KGB, etc., who are killing people without any trials in the in the 30s, 40s, 50s, etc. The fourth uh, idea is that uh, 
society is is very important uh you know we probably entered the period in kind of a developed democracies in which we have an illusion that we we can all do by ourselves we are living increasingly in the atomistic society where actually we we are in an illusion that individual can do everything uh we don't need any other people we can even become even if you're playing music you don't need other 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 players other instruments you can do everything on your computer if you are you know you can play the video games by yourself you can you can do everything by yourself this is an illusion i think because just because the society is invisible we all depend on our societies we all depend on other people we are wearing clothes which other people made we are reading books which other people made we are using goods uh, which other people have made and if you remove that if you remove this society we will be helpless we will be not even robinson crusoe because we will not have those habits of survival and i think we tend to forget about this in this atomization and the war actually tells you that brings you back to this idea that yes we can cherish our individual freedoms we can cherish our individualities but we all connected to a wider network uh and uh, we will not survive without without this network and this network will not survive without us i think one of the lesson that we ukrainians make from this war is that actually uh like we will not survive without our society and our society will not survive without us without our individual responsibility and this is so intertwined interestingly and uh, i think this idea gives you at the same time the idea of responsibility and modesty modesty because you understand that your effort however important it might be is actually a drop in the ocean and if there are no other drops there is no ocean and uh I think the last point I would like to make in this uh, in this speech is that uh maybe it 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 also kind of connects with the first idea that I that I have said that in this war it is of course the question of humanity but at the same time it's a question go, going beyond humanity it's also a war which which leads us to think uh, about life in 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 wider terms uh, not only humans are suffering from this war animals are suffering ecosystems are suffering in in many aspects what russia is doing is not only genocide but also ecocide um the the fact how they put on fire the, the, the fields the ukrainian fields how they destroy the usual ecosystems of the south for example which are so much important for the for the global food you know we go through ukraine we see those you know these fields which were not in which harvests were not collected uh, because of the russian invasion and we understand how the long this chain uh, is and from the fact that the harvests were not collected last year that there are people all around the world who would probably face hunger or famine uh, so we, we see kind of a planet as, as as a single organism in which everything depends on everything else and in which uh when we think about ethics and life uh, we should think beyond humans uh that doesn't mean we should devalue humans of course not but we should understand that you know maybe one of the key ethical revolutions of the 21st century will be a revolution when we extend the idea of dignity from humans to other living beings to to the nature as such and uh, i do think that there are in ukrainian tradition there are also some basis for that because ukrainian culture as maybe many other colonized cultures post colonial cultures colonial cultures which had very difficult relations with the with the empires that they colonized and therefore with this modernity brought by these empires uh modernity is a difficult thing for ukrainians because of the uh because industrialization for example in the 30s brought 
lots of death and millions of of, of deaths. But at the same time, I I do think that we need to think beyond the concepts of tradition and modernity. We need to think beyond the the concepts of uh, of conservatism and progressivism because the time we are going into will require from us to combine the things will require from us to get a very specific subject subject relation with nature which was present in traditional societies and uh, inject it with the modern technologies uh, in order to have a better energy more environmental energy um, greener economy greener societies etc and and therefore i do think that the ukrainian experience uh, including this war experience can help us uh, rethink this as well i will end on this and um, we'll be happy to continue conversation in a dialogue oh. Well, Vladimir, thanks so much for an excellent talk with um, deep insights from uh, the ground in, in Kyiv. I'd like to circle back to the beginning, uh, and you started with the theme of lightness and darkness. And I guess you suggested that darkness is a catalyst for thinking. And I wonder if um, philosophy is a way out of darkness. That is, darkness is a catalyst for thinking. And in some ways, this darkness, I understand, to potentially be bad ideas. What leads to darkness or what is darkness is these bad ideas. And I wonder if you see philosophy and the work you and other Ukrainian philosophies or philosophers are doing in this circumstance as a way to try to, you know, get out of that darkness. Philosophy as a way out of darkness. Do you see the work you're doing in that way? What is the relationship between lightness and dark here? And is philosophy something that can help us? get out of dark times? Well, I do think that it is not philosophy which leads us out of darkness. I do think that this is an individual effort, individual responsibility. It's not philosophers uh, who are killing uh, the, the, the Russian occupiers. It's our brave mm -hmm. soldiers. So we should not... Uh, some of these Ukrainian soldiers are also philosophers or poets or, or cinema makers, but uh, mm -hmm. we should not be kind of a utopian about this uh, at, at one moment the society should become a society of warriors or those who help mm -hmm. the warriors mm -hmm. and I, I think this is a conclusion that that we can make but uh, but I would say that I mean f philosophy is we, we've discussed it with you on, on our podcast with you and uh, remember we actually come across uh, the conclusions that look all those uh, ideas, bad ideas, for example, the the idea that individuals doesn't don't matter, that we see in some of the philosophers, primarily in the in the Russian Russian intellectual tradition, which is now uh, popular in Russia, like people like Ilyin or people like Solovyov or people like Eurasianists, uh, they all deny the role of individual. They all deny. The question of freedom they they are rather saying that look there is something bigger than individual and you should be observed by it you should be uh, you should be just a tiny part of it and uh, without without your proper voice and i think oh when you start thinking in that way you actually go to something very terrible and um, to totalitarianism actually because then you then you actually say that individuals doesn't matter don't matter and individual lives don't matter so uh, i do think we we need to understand how practical ideas is and therefore uh, one of the light motifs of, of discussions in ukraine since 2014 when the war has started that war uh, is whether ideas can kill people whether the wars mm -hmm. can kill people i do think that ideas can kill people Therefore, of course, philosophy is not something very abstract and, and, and very remote. Uh, but I do think that uh, thinking in dark times is actually can open you the way for much sober look at the reality. Because actually, when you start from darkness, you don't have an illusion that everything is bright, everything is OK, everything is clean. Uh, that the light is a norm. You rather you rather start from the 
idea that the darkness is a norm, that suffering is the norm, that pain is a norm. And uh, actually, people who come from, you know, very difficult backgrounds, diff difficult experiences, they usually understand life much better because they understand where the pain comes from. Therefore, for example, when you look at how at the end of enlightenment uh, in the 18th century, how we, we see a, a, a new figure in literature, which is a figure of, uh, of a servant, right? We, we see in the modern literature a repetitive leitmotiv that uh, the key personage, the key character is not one person, but two, right? You have Don Quixote, when there are two characters, you have uh, you have Robinson Crusoe, you have um, Don Juan, you have Faust, uh, and, and etc. And in all these characters, there are two characters. Actually, one character is divided into two. It becomes a double of himself. So the, the next character, the, the other character is like a shadow of the first one and is a servant like Sancho Panza or Scannarello or Leporello or others. And then at a certain moment, it comes to the forefront, like Figaro. It becomes a major character. Or uh, Jacques Fataliste, Jacques Le Fataliste in, in Diderot. And uh, why is that? Because there is a certain thinking, understanding that actually the servant understands life better than his master because he knows the dark side of the life the the suffering the uh, the disrespect the the material hardships etc and you know that was the line then developed by hegel in in a bad way because then marx developed it in his way and then we had an, another totalitarian thought that basically only the servant and only proletariat knows the truth of life and we had all the tragic consequences out of this bad idea right but the initial idea i think it's is it, correct that there is some value in the darkness it doesn't mean that we need to strive the darkness or we need to you know seek the reality of suffering uh no because if if we say that we are very close to actually this thinking of totalitarianism as well, of fascism, for example. But if we are facing it, we need to understand that there is something that we can understand maybe better about life than if we just were sitting in a chair and reading books and enjoying cinema. Mm -hmm. Well, I think um, I take your point that the philosopher is not the soldier, but I nevertheless think the work that you and your Ukrainian colleagues are doing uh, involves countering bad ideas with good and inspiring ideas. And with that, I just want to thank you very much for participating in this benefit event for the Ukrainian Academy. Um, I also want to thank the audience for attending uh, I encourage you to donate what you can to supporting student scholars and publicly engaged academics in Ukraine. We'll put some information up on the screen uh, in a moment so you know what to do to contribute. And I just want to say thank you again, Vladimir. It's a real pleasure and honor. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you very much.